Welcome back to another Monday Night Rewind podcast. Of course, this is the podcast where we go back 20 years to the Monday Night Wars and cover episodes of Raw and Nitro from the corresponding week. And this week we're going back to October 6, 1997, and we're covering Raw number 228 and Nitro number 108. And so before we get into the episodes, I would like to say that obviously you can find this podcast um, here at YouTube, so um, youtube.com slash awesome nerd show, so you can uh, go there and subscribe leave comments on the video like it whatever you want or you can find us on soundcloud and itunes or apple podcast at monday night rewind and on um, itunes and stuff you can go there and leave a review of a star rating up to five and stuff so you can um, listen to this podcast from anywhere you would like and stuff like that and hopefully more coming in the future as i can get more stuff to work so as we get into the shows here so we're starting off with the raw i said it's 228 and this took place in Kansas City, Missouri. And so this show drew an average rating because I tried to get more like stuff to provide you. So ratings and like uh, the like number as an audience and stuff. But I couldn't find the audience thing. But the rating for Raw was an average of a 3.0. And so the show starts off with, uh, of course, this is a sad episode. This is following the Bad Blood pay-per-view. So, of course, the first Hell in a Cell and all that sort of stuff. And it starts off immediately with Vince McMahon in the ring, and he announces, um, of course, that Brian Pillman was found dead on, I think it was Sunday, either Saturday night, Sunday, something like that, because he never made it to the pay-per-view, and he was found dead. Um, And so it has the roster all standing on the stage, and then they do a 10-bell salute to Brian Pillman. And then the actual show starts, so the actual Raw opening and everything starts playing. And then the show kicks off with the DX coming down, to um, the ring so it's Shawn Michaels, Hunter, Hearst Helmsley, and China, and they're being interviewed by Michael Cole who's pretty new at this point in time I doubt this was probably his first appearance but um, he's brand new at this point in time so Michael Cole was you know around 20 years ago so talk about of course obviously how Shawn Michaels won the Hell in a Cell match and then they actually start and uh, Shawn says you know that the click would like to welcome Michael Cole and so their welcoming is a wedgie. They give him a wedgie and then Triple H puts a headlock on him and stuff. And they're just messing with him until they send him out of the ring. And then Sean starts going on that um, in the Hell in a Cell match. He proved that he is the best um, wrestler today. And that uh, he is now the icon of wrestling. And uh, after he mentions that, he starts doing the Ric Flair's uh, strut or whatever across the ring. And then, of course, we get the thing that's uh, kind of a famous saying when related to Shawn Michaels. It's Triple H saying, you know, who's the man, who's the showstopper, and who's the main event? And to each time he says, you know, a different question, Shawn replies me. So it's like, who's the man? Me. Who's the showstopper? Me. Who's the main event? Me. And so, you know, that's a famous thing that's played in regards to Shawn Michaels. And then, uh, so they start talking about, um, of course him winning at bad blood and that they want the truck and so they order people in the truck whatever to play footage from bad blood and nothing like so they you know motion to the titan tron and nothing's coming on the screen and so they keep saying you know people are playing around and like they're getting mad and stuff and saying hey play the video and all this sort of stuff and the video finally starts playing and it happens to be the curtain call and so the dx is all shocked like what is that? And everything. And of course they start mo- looking over at Vince McMahon and uh, trying to get a reaction of him and the whole video's playing. They're like, gonna, like, of course, like Sean's like, wait, that's me. And that's Razor. And that's Diesel. And that's you, Triple H. But you're a bad guy and you're hugging us and all this sort of stuff, you know, playing off that it, it's, you know, whole kayfabe or f- the fakeness of it or whatever and stuff of good guys and bad guys and everything. And uh, so it goes out to Vince, or it keeps showing uh, Vince sitting at the commentary desk. So he's playing off like he didn't know this was going to happen, even though I would be pretty sure that he would, but you never know. But it's just showing that he's mad, and so he um, asks to go to a commercial or whatever. So they go to a commercial and come back, and DX is uh, still harassing Vince. And at, during the commercial, Rick Rude even came out now, so we got the entire DX at that point out. And so, as DX is just harassing Vince or whatever about the whole uh, mantra or the curtain call incident, uh, the Heart Foundation ends up coming out onto the ramp. And of course, this is the famous part where um, uh, Brett says that Sean is the disgrace to the wrestling business and that he's nothing but a degenerate. So then we get. I think the next week probably or so is when they take that name and then form the Degeneration X. So they're not DX yet, but 
that's pretty much what they are. So that's why I call them that. But and of course, Brett moves on. He says, you know, that uh, Triple H uh, stands for homo or whatever. So the H's stand for homo and that they are both homos. So, you know, kind of offensive stuff nowadays. But that's what you know people said back in the day in the 90s and stuff. So he's calling Triple H and Sean homos. And that he, he then moves on saying that uh, he ran Deezer, Diesel and Razor out of the town and that he will start with Triple H tonight because he's going to have a match with him. And then he says he's going to kick uh, Sean's scrawny ass at Survivor Series and then they leave. And then so after they leave, it goes back to Sean and Triple H in the ring. And uh, Sean mentions that um, just says that again, another famous part that Brett is a zero, my hero or something like that. Or you are a zero, my hero. And then um, he mentions at the very end that the Click owns this business, you know, referring to the him and Triple H and WWE. And then you have Kevin, Ash, Scott Hall, and Six or Xbox, whatever, um, and the NWO, which are the top there. So that's why they're saying that the Click runs the business. After that, we move on to, um, we get a, like, footage or just a scene or whatever of, like, a couch in, like, a house somewhere. And Vince mentions that they're going to be talking to Brian Pillman's wife on for an on-screen interview in a little bit. And so, of course, that's got mixed reactions about them doing that. But from there, it moves on to our first match of the night. And it's the Headbangers versus the Godwins. And, of course, the Godwins are the tag team champions. And I believe this is probably for the titles. I'm not exactly sure. But this is going to be a Lumberjack match. So, of course, you have pretty much all this, the lower card people out there as the Lumberjacks. But the match starts. And at the very beginning, the Headbangers do a jump over the top rope like they just you know jump over the top ropes onto the lumberjacks and they start like crowd surfing on them or whatever until the uh, lumberjacks put them back in the ring and stuff and so then the um, actual match starts and it's going on there's not much that really goes on or big happens during the thing but at one point the LOD ends up getting into the ring and they start attacking the godwins and so because of that all hell breaks loose so everyone gets in the ring and they fight for like a couple seconds and then they one by one, they all start, you know, getting back out of the ring. But with the distraction and stuff like that, Mosh is able to get a roll-up pin on Phineas, so the Headbangers get the win there. But like I said, I don't know if that was for the titles or not. I would think with the Lumberjack match, they would kind of do that, but I don't know for sure. I don't remember the Headbangers leaving with the titles or anything, so it may not have been. But then next up, we get a match of Miguel from Los Bariquas, and he's taken on the returning Mark Mayer, who of course comes out with Sable. And so, uh, Mero came back from a knee injury that he's been out for a couple months with, and he's in his new boxing attire, as they called it, and so he's got, like, the boxer, uh, shorts on, and he's wearing all black and stuff, and he's, uh, with this new boxer gimmick, he's doing, uh, punches and stuff, so, and they mentioned, of course, that he was a Golden Gloves boxer and on the U.S. boxing team or something like that, all sorts of boxing-related stuff, so he's now a boxer or whatever. And so, match ends, though, a lot much else happens in it, but the match ends with Mara doing his new finisher of the TKO, which the TKO is just a diamond cut, or a cut, or whatever you want to call it, like a diamond cutter, but he gets him on the shoulders, kind of like Brock does for that five, but then he does the thing that, which Diamond Dallas Page did this move last weekend, spoiler alert, he does it again this week, but he gets him up on the shoulders, and then, um, instead of, like, uh, swinging their, uh, bodies, or I forget how Brock how he like swings pe or like you know throws people up exactly but he just pretty much just throws their legs backwards behind him and then he comes down with a like a diamond cutter and that's the tko and then next up so we get a preview of it first but they say you know coming up next and it's a that jim Cornette's gonna do a rant type thing which i remember him doing this and i think it's kind of funny um but entertaining at the same time so then we go to commercial and come back and it gets into the thing and so jim Cornette, that's there and he's just ranting about the treatment of professional wrestlers especially and he names Arn Anderson, Ric Flair, and then people like Mankind or Cactus Jack. Um, and he's saying, referring mostly to the NW, uh, uh, the WCW at this point, but he's saying that the NWO is like a kid's club. And, you know, Kevin Nash can't wrestle and he acts like a little kid. Scott Hall can wrestle, but he never drew a dime. Uh, Six just likes to get, people just like to see him get drunk. And then how he left an active contract or whatever with the WWF. So what, I don't know exactly what he, how he meant or worded, but how Six or X-Pac left um, WWF at that time. And then uh, he mentions Eric Bischoff that he just likes to throw around a billionaire's money and that he's just a mark. So a really high dedicated fan. So technically I'd be considered a mark. 
And then um, that wrestling promoters and fans need to respect real talent again of what art likes of Arn Anderson, Ric Flair, and people like Mick Foley and stuff like that. And so he's just digging on WCW and, you know, the raising of Hulk Hogan, hauling out pretty much the NWO and stuff like that. And then from there, we go into our next match, which is Rocky Maivia versus British Bulldog. And of course, The Rock comes out with The Nation and British Bulldog comes out with The Heart Foundation. Um, so throughout the match, uh, The Rock at one point ends up hitting the people's elbow, even though it's not called that at the time. And he doesn't do the whole run thing. He just stands next to the guy and he runs over, bounces off the ropes once and then drops the elbow. And um, the Bulldog, British Bulldog, ends up hitting the power slam for the win to end the match. And immediately, Fruit gets in the ring and starts attacking the heart foundation with a belt so he's just like really whipping them all with a, his belt and stuff it looks nasty and so the all both the teams just all start fighting and so Fruke's mad or whatever at owen hart because of um losing at bad blood so owen hart's now the you know current intercontinental champion and stuff like that and so that leads into hour two and it kicks off with a hell in a cell recap just showing you know a bunch of stills or whatever parts from the hell in a cell match which of course Shawn michaels won Due to the interference of Kane, which we will see later. And then this moves on to a Stone Cold interview in the ring by Vince McMahon. And Vince mentions that Stone Cold didn't bring his doctor's note to be able to show that he can wrestle. And that Vince has the paper he holds up showing it. That he has the paper for Austin to sign the um, liability papers or whatever. So it's Austin signs that he can't. Uh, the WWF won't be responsible for if he get injured, any, injured anymore. And Stone Cold says that he uh, will sign the release if he gets the face Owen Hart for the Intercontinental Championship. And Vince says, you know, he he will do it or whatever, but he'll get like a title shot eventually or whatever type of thing. And so um, Vince tries to do a handshake agreement, but Austin doesn't trust him. And that he Austin says that he wants Vince to so have a signed agreement, you know, so he can't go back on it and stuff. But uh, Farouk and the Nation of Domination end up interrupting on the Titantron and say that uh, Stone Cold's going to get pay or whatever for getting involved in the Nation's business because Stone Cold pretty much allowed Owen to win the belt at Bad Blood so that way he could be able to take it back off of him and stuff. And so that's pretty much how the whole thing ends. And so Austin's uh, raising hell at the end after, you know, his music playing. He's just going around the ring doing crazy stuff. Vince returns back to the commentary table. And Stone Cold goes over and picks up Jerry the King Waller's uh, crown and goes in the ring and then just kicks it and goes flying out into the crowd and stuff. And so that was kind of funny. Um, then coming back from a break, they announced that they set an attendance record there for Kansas City. And so that's, and they announced it's like 13,000 something or something along those lines. But then we move into our next match of Owen Hart versus Hawk from the Nation, or from the Legion of Doom. And, uh, the commentary mentions that this is Hawk's first singles title opportunity. And shortly after the match starts, uh, the Godwins is up coming out to ringside. And, of course, with them being out there at one point, uh, Hawk ends up bouncing off the ropes to get ready to hit Owen. But as he's doing it, Phineas hits him in the back of the head with a bucket. And so Animal runs out to start to help Hawk or whatever against the Godwins. But uh, he ends up just fighting with one of them. I can't remember which one exactly the whole time. But Hawk does a, ends up doing a diving clothesline off the top rope onto Owen and gets ready to go for the pin. But Henry gets in and hits Hawk in the back of the head with the horseshoe. So like Uncle Elmer or Cletus, whatever his name is, horseshoe that he carries around. And so because that Owen's able to flip Hawk over and gets um, the pin because of uh, Hawk being knocked out by Henry. And so Owen Hart wins the match. And so next up, we get the interview with Melanie Pillman, Brian Pillman's wife. And of course, she's sitting like on the couch in her home with the camera on her. And she has a thing in her ear so Vince can talk to her. And they say that... uh announced that Brian Pillman was um so f as like so far been announced to have passed away due to a heart attack and that there, p there was a possibility of it being an overdose on painkillers because his heart was under a lot of stress and stuff like that and Melanie mentions you know that with the wrestling business the way it is and then him having his horrible car wreck years ago and his having his surgery on his uh, uh ankle or whatever foot and ankle leg whatever being fused and stuff and having uh pain problems with that so he was on painkillers and stuff and then i thought it was kind of insensitive or whatever but vince like uh now that brian's gone and you're a single parent what are you gonna do to be able to raise your kids and stuff like that and i just thought it was uh kind of offensive be like well your husband's dead now what are you gonna do and it's like because we're not paying for you or anything like that type thing but just kind of insensitive of course the day after her husband died she has to be on national or nationwide you know tv or whatever dealing with this or whatever and uh she, 
Vince asked her, how do you want, how do you think Brian wants to be remembered? And she says that he was a loving man, the best father, and that he loved the wrestling business and that um, he lived and died for wrestling. So, and then immediately following that, there's a video package played on Brian Pillman with a, that's voiced over by JR and stuff. And it was a really good video thing, but just a sad tragedy to all the stuff that went on and death at such a young age, because I think he was like 37 or something. Then next up, we're going to have a match that the commentary announced as the Hardy Boys, so they're in the ring already, against the Truth Commission. But before the Truth Commission comes out, we end up getting Kane's music playing, and Kane comes out. So this is his Raw debut since he debuted the night before at Bad Blood. And so Kane obviously comes out with Paul Bear, and as he gets in the ring, he attacks both the Hardy Boys. He ends up choke slamming them, and then throws um, each of them out of the ring. Like, throws Matt, I believe, first, and then picks Jeff up and throws him out on top of Matt. And so the Hardy Boys are gone now. And so Bear starts saying that, um, you know, everyone is always laughing at the Fat Man, but they should be laughing at the Phenom, as in The Undertaker, because of um, the stuff that's happened to him. And The Undertaker is going to be haunted by Kane and stuff like that. Um, just doesn't really say a whole lot just that stuff we've heard in the past already about Kane you know being his brother and the stuff Undertaker did to him or whatever but not much else going on there and from there we go into our main event for the night which is Triple H who obviously comes out with China and he's taking on Bret Hart and so this thing where Bret you know said he's gonna run Triple H out of town or whatever um so of course as the match starts Bret is just very aggressive against Triple H so doing a lot of brawling and just um just not letting him up or whatever just continuously attacking him and of course Shawn Michaels ends up coming out the ringside and he does uh kind of his um again another famous part or whatever and it's he goes over to the Canadian flag that's up on the ring post and he like takes the end of it and you know like starts wiping his nose on it and then sticks up his nose and st like starts walking back and forth until the um, flag is like at pulled tight or whatever and it's like it's pulling him away and stuff just doing that weird stuff with the flag up his nose and because of that Owen Hart uh, British Bulldog and Jim Neihart end up coming out to ringside you know to kind of be there to watch Brett's back um then at one point Brett ends up getting the sharp super on Triple H but China ends up coming over and like pushing the ropes toward Triple H so he's able to reach the rope and break the hold and then at one point Rick Rude ends up coming out and starts attacking the Hart Foundation from behind and so he's drawing those three uh the other three members attention and stuff and at that time brett's pulling triple h over to one of the ring posts to do the figure four movie he's been doing a lot um and as he's getting ready to put it on triple h china comes up and uh, hits brett hart and then on the second time she goes to hit him brett hart catches it and he's like holding onto her arm and then she ducks or moves over to the side a little bit and Shawn Michaels ends up super kidding, kicking Bret Hart and ends up like knocking him out or whatever. And so he's laying out and Triple H gets back into the ring and uh, the ref ends up counting Bret out. So Triple H gets the win by count out. And so after the win, the Hart Foundation ends up running back down to the ring, you know, to get after DX. But um, Triple H, uh, Sean, and China end up escaping and running back up the ramp as Foundation is getting into the ring. And so that's the end of that show. It was pretty decent. So it's um, beginning, you know, really of the uh, Attitude Era. So we get the debut of Kane. We got Jim Cornette going on his rants. We have the death of Brian Pillman that, you know, set up all that, you know, put the like sadness on the episode and stuff and then of course dx running amok as they're starting to do at this point so it was pretty decent overall and so as i said that got a 3.0 rating on that episode of raw and now we move on to nitro and this is episode 108 of nitro and it took place in minneapolis minnesota and it got a 3.9 rating so you know almost a whole point higher than raw at this point showing that they you know were in domination of the monday night wars and stuff and winning at this point but the show kicks off with the Nitro girls dancing on the ramp and then one of the girls in the front is dancing she does like a bounce move type thing and one of her breasts pops out and so there's a blur on the uh, screen and stuff so I was like I'm sure people enjoyed that but of course on the network and stuff it's blurred out so I just thought that was funny and surprised it hadn't happened before now maybe it has it wasn't has it happened before now but first time I've seen it but it was just funny. But the show then kicks off with our first segment, which is Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff coming out to the ring to do a promo. And Hulk Hogan's just saying that um, Sting's always too afraid to face Hogan because every time Hogan's there, Sting never shows up. And again, that happens again the night Sting never shows up. And then that Hogan will be waiting for Piper or Roddy Roddy Piper, whatever, to arrive so he can read him the riot act and just stuff, whatever, 
leading for their match in Halloween Havoc. And we get our first match then, which is Jeff Jarrett coming out with Deborah against Booker T coming out with Miss Jackie. And so as the match goes on and stuff, uh, the crowd is firmly behind Booker T. So every time Booker T does something, they cheer um, really loud for him. Then at one point, Booker gets uh, Jarrett roll like does a roll up on him. But Jarrett, Jarrett uh, ends up poking Booker T's eyes. And so that breaks the pinfall. And then uh, soon after, Booker T ends up hitting his scissor kick. I forget what it's called, like or if it has a move besides the scissor kick. And goes for the pin, but Jeff Jarrett ends up getting his foot on foot on the ropes, and so he's just always able to escape. And then um, towards the end of the match, Steve Mongo Michaels ends up coming out, and he comes out to Deborah, and he's just talking with the ringside. And so Jeff Jarrett gets up to like try and you know interject him then them or whatever and steve mcmichaels ends up punching jarrett in the face sending him back into the ring and then booker ends up getting a roll up on jeff jarrett for the pin so booker t gets a win over jeff jarrett there uh next up we get a match of billy kidman who i believe is pretty new at this point like i think they mentioned that he's only had a couple matches or is new or something like that and he's taking on alex wright and so as the match is starting we get um raven whatever the camera pans over and raven and perry saturn is now so he's now joined with Raven, uh, sitting uh, ringside, and they mentioned that, you know, they've had past connections in a uh, different federation or whatever, talking about ECW. Um, and as the match is going on, we get a video footage uh, backstage of Steve McMichaels and Deborah fighting, and uh, so it's just them going back and forth, and Jeff Jarrett comes up, and Mongo's telling Jarrett to, you know, back away and stay out of our business and stuff. But it goes back into the ring, and so there's obviously a lot the match going on or whatever and Billy Kinman looks really good at this point so he's hitting a lot of good moves and like being really impressive and stuff so um, I can never see why he gets raised up later on in his career and stuff but of course I think he does join uh, Raven's flock or something that's when he starts wearing the wife beater and jean shorts and stuff but Billy Kinman ends up going up for what I believe it's his 450 splash it's whatever his big move is or whatever but Alex Wright ends up rolling out of the way and then Alex is able to hit a German suplex on Billy Kidman for the win. Then from there we get another Nitro Girls segment. This time they're dancing in the ring and then while that's going on the commentary's doing a commercial for the Nitro party and they say that there's one going on in Orlando the night that night or something so that's like their Nitro party I guess. From there we go into our next match of Mortis coming out with James Vandenberg and he's taking on Ernest Miller and of course with the two of them there's a lot of martial arts maneuvers so they're doing a lot of kicks and just like it looks exactly like you'd see in like a karate movie type thing almost at one point Ernest Miller goes up to do his whatever his kick thing is where he jumps up on the ropes and like spins and then does a kick or whatever uh, but as he's going up there James Vandenberg pulls on the ropes and Ernest Miller ends up getting crotched on the top rope and then following that uh, Mortis ends up climbing up and hits a lethal leg drop as they call it off the top rope so while Ernest is crotched or whatever and goes for the pin but he puts his feet up on the rope you know they'll get leverage or whatever and stuff and the rep notices and stops the pin later in the match Ernest Miller ends up uh, getting hit his spinning kick or whatever off the top rope that he does and gets the pin off of that so Ernest gets a win over Mortis then for some reason we get an NWO commercial but it's just for the Macho Man so it's just showing like highlights of matches and stuff of him so I don't know why because usually they're selling like shirts or something but it was just a thing on Macho Man and then from there we get our next segment lead into a match which is Scott Hall coming out with six and they just come out for a promo at first and of course Scott Hall ends up uh, doing the pull to the crowd and you know saying everyone's here to see the NWO and stuff and then he's talking about how Kevin Ash and Scott Hall both of them um, got injured over the weekend because they were watching old videotapes and they were of Larry Zbysko and watching him wrestle made him laugh that they were laughing so hard that you know one of them fell off of their seat or whatever and stuff and just that they're both injured or whatever and then they end up at one point saying some saying something in reference to luger and then obviously doing the crotch chop in reference to him so pretty much telling him to suck it and then we go to a commercial and come back and it's the beginning of our hour two of nitro and it gets into a match where Hector Garza comes out and he has his rematch against Scott Hall. So Scott Hall and Six were still in the ring. And since Hector got the win over Scott a week or two, whenever that was, a couple weeks ago, they get a rematch now. So, of course, Scott Hall pretty much dominates the whole match. But he is, like, selling the injured ribs, even though I'm pretty sure it's just fake the whole time. But he's just fakely selling the ribs. 
then at one point, uh, Scott Hall ends up pinning the ref against the turnbuckle. Like, he's just holding back, like, kind of, like, distracting him and stuff. And Six runs in and hits the Bronco ride onto Hector Garza, who's, of course, sitting in the corner. But then later on, uh, Scott Hall ends up hitting the Outsider's Edge on Hector Garza and ends up shoving the ref. Like, after he hits it, he puts his foot on top of Hector Garza and then, like, grabs hold of the ref and shoves him down to the ground to be able to count the pin. And then, um, Scott Hall wins or whatever and, you know, he's raising, the ref's raising, uh, Scott Hall's hand and Six kicks the ref in the side of the head or something while he's doing it so then they start beating up on the ref and scott hall picks up the ref and puts him into the torture act signifying of larry zabisco as me and the ref in the match and then of course the torture act in reference to luger that he's having the match against and then um after he puts the ref back down the ref's lane face down on the mat they pull out a bottle of spray paint and spray paint a z on the ref's back in the KD you know, Larry Zabisco and stuff. Following that, we then get a little featurette type thing on Goldberg, and it's just showing the highlights of his first couple matches, seeing, you know, more stuff about him being a football player, and that how he pulled off two impressive wins or whatever, his first two matches or whatever. And then that goes into another Nitro Girls segment where they dance on the ramp, leading into a next match of DDP versus Disco Inferno, and Disco's the TV champ, but again, I don't. I doubt this is for the... Yeah, this is not for the title, though. Um, So in the match, at one point, DDP ends up trying to hit the diamond cutter on Disco, but Disco ends up escaping, and, like, he escapes and slides out the ring and just starts, like, running up the ramp, being like, no, 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 like, you're not gonna hit me with that. But he ends up, obviously, coming back to the ring to finish the match. Commentaries mention how Disco Inferno will end up facing Jackie at Halloween Havoc, so he got it. Uh, she got the match with him, or whatever, and it will be for the title, so it's just kind of funny. But Diamond Dallas Page is able to get the Diamond Cutter, and it's in the form of the TKO, so as I mentioned, with Mark Marrow in Raw in the raw section page does the same move or whatever but it's his diamond cutter so we get that move repeat so again we're getting a lot of repeat stuff on every episode like something that happens in one show always happens in the other after he hits the diamond cutter macho man ends up running out um so that doesn't get the pin or whatever and he attacks ddp and so diamond dallas page gets the win by disqualification and then macho man um, they fight to the outside and macho man you know pulls up the padding and exposes the concrete floor and he goes to try to do a pile driver on diamond dallas page but but rowdy piper ends up running out and stopping the macho man from doing it and then with that distraction of stopping macho man ddp is able to turn macho man around and hit a diamond cutter onto the exposed floor knocking him out and immediately found that piper and ddp end up uh together running out through the crowd to escape whatever as the nwo is running out and they come out to like you know help macho man get him up and you know they're tr acting like he's seriously injured and they call for an ambulance so an emt or a couple emts come out with a stretcher and they're trying to like load him up on it and of course uh, elizabeth is there and she's like freaking out and like pretending to cry and stuff like that macho man is all hurt and everything and then hogan looks in the camera and says that um dp and piper are gonna pay and that to not let them leave the building so that the nwo can get back at him and then commentary is just having fun the whole time and laughing at um, macho man being injured and as it goes off to commercial, Larry, or Tony Schiavone is just dying laughing and stuff. I'm sure it's like a fake laugh, but he's just dying laughing and stuff, happy with what's going on. And back from commercial, we get uh, Mean Gene doing an interview in ring, and he brings back out Roddy Piper. And so again, Piper just starts uh, talking about stuff going on, and he mentions that, you know, if there were twin Hogans, they would almost have a full head of hair, so again, making fun of Hogan's lack of um, hair or whatever and so if there even if there were two of them they still wouldn't have a full head of hair and then uh that Scott Hall lies more than um, than Minnesota has lakes so I would assume by that Minnesota has a lot of lakes and so that Scott Hall lies a lot and so he makes the stipulation that Scott Hall and Kevin Ash will have to defend their titles next week at Nitro and then Scott Hall and Luger will be in a last man standing match. So he calls it, I think, a Piper match or something. And Mean Gene was like, what does that mean? He's like, it means that there are no rules. You can do whatever you want. And that the last person standing or whatever and stuff. So uh, Mean Gene's like, you mean they're going to be in a last man standing match or something like that? So that's what they're going to do. And then um, after that, Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff end up coming out to the ring to confront Piper. And Hogan, you know, wants to know what gives Piper the right to um, tell the NWO what to do. And that everyone is here to see Hogan in the NWO, not WC. So Piper shouldn't have a say in stuff. And of course that he will tell, tear Piper apart in their cage match at Halloween Havoc. And then uh, Hulk Hogan takes the microphone and like kind of pushes it against Roddy Piper. 
And so Piper shoves Hulk Hogan back and then they start fighting. And uh, as soon as that happens, Eric Bischoff kicks Piper in the back of the leg, taking Piper down. And Hogan starts, you know, get, gets on top of him, starts beating him. And then uh, Hogan gets Piper up and he's holding him for Eric Bischoff because he's Eric Bischoff's going to kick him. But of course, Piper ducks as you assumed he would. And Eric, Eric Bischoff kicks Hogan in the side of the head. And so that allows Piper to get the upper hand and he starts hitting Bischoff. And then Hogan, since he's now not, Piper's not paying attention to him, Hulk Hogan grabs him. And they start fighting again, but this time Piper gets on top of him and is, you know, taken over. But Bischoff at that point comes, you know, to or whatever, and wakes up enough and starts motioning for the NWO to come out. So they all run out and Hulk Hogan rolls out of the ring. So Piper's in the ring surrounded by the NWO. And so he picks up uh, Hogan's title belt and starts just like swinging it around over his head and stuff. And as the NWO members try and get in the ring, he starts swinging it at them. And so keeping them all out of the ring. And so that ends that segment and then we go into a Nitro Girls segment dancing in the ring. And then it goes to commentary where they announce updates to the Halloween Havoc. Um, and they say that in the match of uh, Steve Mongo McMichaels against Jeff Jarrett that if Steve McMichaels win, Deborah will have to leave WCW. And then they bring up again how Scott Hall and Kevin Nash will have to defend their titles next week. Or if they don't, they'll have to release the titles. And then from there, we get our first report, uh, Mike Tenay's on the Luchadors. So it's talking about, you know, what Luchador means in uh, Spanish, uh, but whatever it means. And then it shows the arena Mexico and then different companies that are in Mexico that have luchadors and stuff like that. And then postpone or say how, you know, luchador or lucha wrestling got started. Famous stars like El Santo and stuff like that. And then of course they are transition into movie stars as well into like B movies and just how famous luchadors are. And then of course this says next week, we'll go into the history of the mask, uh, mask and stuff like that. So lucha mask. And then fittingly, that leads into our next match of Eddie Guerrero, who's the Cruiserweight Champ, taking on the Ultimo Dragon. And so, of course, with these two, as you could possibly guess or imagine, um, it's a good technical match. And, of course, the high flying that they do is really good. There's no real botches and stuff. Um, but throughout the match, nothing really big happens, you know, out of the normal. But uh, Ultimo Dragon does get the Dragon Sleeper on Eddie Guerrero, but Eddie's able to get his feet to the ropes to break it. And then Eddie ends up hitting a spinning DDT, I believe it was, um, followed and then, of course, goes up and hits the Frog Splash to get the pin and win over Ultimo Dragon. And then from there, we get our main event match of the night, which is Chris Benoit versus Kurt Henning, and who, of course, Kurt's the um, U.S. champion at this point. And so this is kind of like a grudge match type thing of Chris Benoit trying to get back at Kurt for the stuff he did to Ric Flair. And so as the, the stuff starts, Kurt Henning, Benoit came out first and then Kurt Henning and as her, Kurt Henning's walking up the highway, for some reason he just like goes over to a fan and like puts his hand on the railing and is like talking to someone. And Chris Benoit just runs up and kicks his leg out. So he does the whole like weird like like kick flip hype thing. I don't know what you call it. That he was doing um, the week before or a couple weeks before or whatever with Jeff Jarrett. And so as I mentioned in this match, of course, and commentary says that, that Benoit's out there get, trying to get revenge for Ric Flair. And then as the match goes on, Kurt Henning starts attacking Benoit's left leg. So trying to get him weakened or whatever, you know, so he can't move as well. And then at one point, Kurt Henning ex takes the cover off one of the top turnbuckles. And so once he does that, they obviously try to start throwing each other into it so at one point Kurt Henning goes to throw Benoit into the thing but Benoit is able to counter it and he sends Kurt Henning into the exposed turnbuckle and then uh, Chris Benoit goes to do his German suplex and but uh, Kurt Henning is able to elbow Benoit to get out of it and so after that Benoit starts to um, sling Kurt Henning into that turnbuckle and like Kurt Henning does hit it like he hits back first into the turnbuckle and then of course Benoit goes to chase after to do like a splash or something but Henning moves out of the way and uh, Chris Benoit ends up running into the turnbuckle, kind of like knocking him out. And Kurt Henning grabs him and hits the su uh, fisherman suplex on him to get the pin. And then the NWO members uh, come running out and they start beating up on Chris Benoit. Which then out of nowhere we get Ric Flair running in and starts attacking the NWO and chases them off. And then he chases Kurt Henning through the back. And so he like they run up the highway and stuff. Kurt Henning goes off to the side of the stage. But I think Ric Flair ends up running through the stage. But as they're running up the aisle, or Flair is, the um, security manager guy, Doug Dillinger, he like sticks his hand out or something to like stop Flair. But Flair just hits him and Doug just falls straight back. Like Flair just like hit him and <laughs> knocked him back. And he falls back onto the ground and stuff. And I thought it was funny. But uh, Flair chases him through the back and they end up running out into the... Um, streets of Minneapolis or whatever and um once Flair you know gets to like the sidewalks and stuff 
He turns around and walks back and comes back out to the ring. And Mean Gene is out there waiting for him to do an interview. Um, but he's do Mean Gene meets him at the ramp, but Ric Flair grabs the microphone and he walks to the ring. And he just starts talking about a bunch of random stuff. But he says that um, the NWA... But it, um, he starts by saying, telling the NWO that this is what real life is. Like, you know, the passion stuff that's going on. And that he's been beat many times over and over again, but yet he's still standing. And that he's coming for Kurt Henning at Halloween Havoc, whether it's a booked match or not. And then after he's done with Henning, he's coming for Hogan. If there's anything left of Hogan after Piper gets done with him in the cage match. And then he starts uh, striding across the ring and wooing and then leaves. And that's how the show ends. So I thought, to me, Nitro was a little bit better. I mean, it was long, but I just thought it was a little more entertaining. But of course, we don't have Brian Pillman's death hanging over the show and, you know, kind of dragging the mood down and stuff of the sadness and everything. So I thought Nitro was probably a little better this week. But that's it for your coverage of Raw number 228 and Nitro number 108 from October 6, 1997. And so, like I said, both shows were good again as they were back in the days, but I thought Nitro was a little bit better. So that's going to be it for this Monday Night Rewind podcast. Again, you can find us on YouTube. So leave a comment and subscribe there. And you can uh, follow or find us on Apple Podcasts or iTunes and SoundCloud under Monday Night Rewind. So you can um, follow and subscribe there so you never miss an episode. You can leave comments and ratings in iTunes. So if you could do all that for me, I'd greatly appreciate it. So that's going to be it this week for the Monday Night Rewind podcast. And I'll see you next time. (laughs) 